About a year ago, I was lucky enough to be involved in a discovery uh, at the Whipple Museum um, of the History of Science just across the way. Uh, I'd just started my PhD in the History of Science and I was studying a medieval manuscript, a 14th century description of an equatorium, which is a, a device designed to compute the positions of the planets. And I read uh, that a replica had been produced of this 14th century instrument. Naturally, I was keen to see it. The only trouble was nobody knew anything about it, except that it had at one time perhaps been at the Whipple Museum. So obviously the next step would be to look in the archives to try and find some references to it. So I made an appointment to do just that. To cut a very strong, long story short, when I went in for the, my appointment with the curatorial team and explained what it was uh, that, uh, that had been produced and mysteriously disappeared, the two looked at each other and one of them said to me, do you think it might have looked a bit like this? Called up the electronic catalogue and there was a picture that looked exactly like the object uh, that I'd been looking for and had imagined. The only trouble was the object name listed in the catalogue was King Arthur's Table. <laughs> so obviously the next step was to go out to the stores and to have a look and see what it was that this object was. And we found it uh, wedged between a storage unit and the wall. Uh, we wheeled it out uh, and this is what it looked like. It's about six foot in diameter to, to give you some sense of scale. Uh, so obviously a number of questions jumped out at me, like how did it end up behind a storage unit at the Whipple Museum uh, and uh, how did it get the name King Arthur's Table? And that's uh, the story I'm going to present for you today. And it's a story uh, really that uh, begins with this man, uh, Derek de Sola Price, who discovered uh, the manuscript in 1951. But the same year... The Whipple Museum itself opened its doors. Cambridge University set its first exam paper in the history of science. And the British Society for the History of Science had been founded just four years earlier. So we're back to those points that uh, Sam was making about the foundation of a discipline. So this story really isn't just about uh, an object. It's about a museum, a department, and a discipline. And I think... Um, Although, as Sam pointed out, ISIS, um, the uh, journal in the history of science, was founded much earlier, um, it took a little bit longer to take off in this country. And it's really in the post-war period uh, that we're looking at the foundation of a discipline. And, uh, and, and that's what I'm hoping to bring out to you a little bit today. So these are some of the questions uh, I'd like to look at. Uh, how and why it was made, how it went from being displayed at the Royal Society to uh, being King Arthur's table, and what it is that we can learn uh, from this journey. Now, um, as uh, Sam said, history of science professionalized itself to a great degree uh, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the middle part of the 20th century. But um, a large part of the interest in science, in the history of science, came from those practitioners who were trying to look at the context of their own work. And one of those key practitioners was this man, Lawrence Bragg, the youngest ever winner of a Nobel Prize in 1915. Uh, and by the time that uh, the object I'm looking at was made, was the director of the Cavendish Laboratory. Now, uh, Bragg uh, took over the Cavendish Laboratory when it was at the peak of its fame, um, having been the location of the discovery of the electron and the neutron. But he realized that in order to be able to continue competing with the hugely well-financed research laboratories, uh, in the USA, he was going to have to carry out some pretty thoroughgoing reforms. He wrote about his plans in 1942 and carried them out uh, immediately after the Second World War, talking about small unit cells, as you might say, of scientists, each with their own workshop. Why is this important to our story? Well, it's the workshop. He talks about the importance of machinery and the importance of materials. So the result of Bragg's reforms, really, uh, is a Cavendish laboratory entirely, re uh, entirely renewed uh, with a huge number of workshops, all staffed by expert, quite often bored technicians uh, with plenty of materials on hand. Now, uh, as I've said, Bragg was a scientist. He wasn't a historian of science, and he was very much... Uh, straying into the boundaries of this brand new discipline. Um, a discipline which, uh, as often is the case with uh, 
uh, disciplinary formation was trying to establish its borders uh, and professionalize itself and lay down a template for how it was to be carried out in this period. Now, it's something I don't have a huge amount of time to go into, but this is a sense of what the historians who dominated the field uh, really in this period, uh, led by uh, Herbert Butterfield from just down the road at Peterhouse, uh, thought about the scientists. Uh, they weren't very impressed with scientists muscling in on their territory. Now, I have to say, for reasons of time, I've cut out the scientists' response, but I can assure you they gave as good as they got. Um, now, one of those so-called second-rate scientists, as you might have thought, or as the historians thought, was this man, in a younger version of the photograph I showed you earlier. Uh, now, he had studied at the Southwest Essex Technical College, which if you've not heard of that, you can be pretty sure that the Cambridge historians of the 1950s wouldn't have done either. Um, and he had studied metal physics uh, to PhD level, uh, which he received about the time this photograph was taken, just after the Second World War. So he was a scientist uh, by background. It also probably didn't help that he was uh, from a working class family, a Jewish family in the East End of London. Um, and uh, this wouldn't exactly have endeared him to establishment uh, historians, uh, some of whom we'll encounter a little bit further on. But uh, after gaining his PhD, uh, Price um, went to Malaya, to Singapore, uh, where he taught applied mathematics at the university there. And it was while there that his university purchased, or so the story goes, the story that he told himself in very dramatic fashion many times, um, the university library purchased some bound volumes of the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. Price, intending to read them, stacked them in neat decade piles against the wall of his study, noticed that they made a lovely exponential curve, and formulated a theory about the growth of science, which later became the, uh, the, the field of scientometrics. And Price is now, um, now regarded as a pioneer in that, the scientific study of science, if you like. Uh, but back then, he was a penniless uh, student looking to do his second PhD, this time in the history of science. He came to Cambridge, uh, and to cut a very long story short, he was looking at instrument treatises, manuscript treatises, and he came upon this one in the library of Peterhouse. And he instantly noticed it was written in Middle English, it had the date 1392 all over it, and it was obviously a description of an instrument with which he was unfamiliar. Um, and uh, he jumped to the conclusion that it was by Geoffrey Chaucer, the English poet and astronomer, which isn't as crazy as it might sound if you're not familiar with Chaucer's astronomical work. Uh, Chaucer had written a treatise on the astrolabe uh, just the previous year, 1391. That's still our best guess for the, for the date of that treatise. Uh, and, um, and also that treatise on the astrolabe was the first treatise on a scientific instrument in the English language. So it's not crazy to attribute it to Chaucer, and his name does in fact appear in the manuscript. I don't have time to go into the authorship question, suffice it to say it continues to be debated, but Price dedicated his PhD to proving that case. And here's his PhD as it was published by the University Press with Chaucer given a co-author credit, shall we say. <laughs> now, uh, as soon as he discovered this manuscript in December 1951, Price leapt into action. Uh, he had the manuscript photographed under UV and infrared light at the Cavendish Laboratory. And if you think that's a strange thing or a, a very fortunate facility uh, for Price to have, uh, that's certainly the case. But he was helped by the fact that he had an excellent working relationship with Lawrence Bragg because Bragg was interested in the history of his own discipline and Price had helped him catalogue the Cavendish Laboratory archives. Um, a sort of form of patronage that helped Price gain a fellowship as well um, uh, and enabled him to fund his studies. Infrared photography is the kind of thing that you might expect medieval historians to want to do with their manuscript. Building full-scale models of them, possibly not so much. Uh, even today, although today it has to be said possibly reconstructing past science is something entirely credible uh, within uh, the history of science community, I wouldn't say it was then. His historians were scholars, they dealt with texts, they didn't get their hands dirty. So why did Price? Well, if we look at the months immediately following his discovery, we get a little clue because he wrote about the discovery in the Times in February, following the discovery in December and the birth of his son, Geoffrey, in January. Didn't seem to be too much of a distraction. Um, 
In, uh, it hit the Times in February. He wrote a two-part summary of his discovery in the Times Literary Supplement uh, in February and March 1952. And uh, it went worldwide with newspapers in Portugal, New Zealand, South Africa, you name it, uh, covering this story. So this is a man trying to establish uh, his own personal credibility, I think, given what I've said about his background, but also perhaps the credibility of his discipline. Now, a man who knew a thing or two about establishing credibility was Lawrence Bragg. Bragg was, uh, in his role as the Cavendish professor, something of an elder statesman of science. His job wasn't just managing the laboratory, it was also promoting its work to the wider world. The best place to do that, of course, was the Royal Society. The Royal Society, twice a year, held what they called conversaciones, social events at which the great and the good quaff some kind of drink, uh, and, uh, and heard about the latest scientific discoveries. So this would be the perfect venue for Price to show his off. Two problems, though. First of all, uh, this was about scientific discovery, not discovery in the history of science. And secondly, uh, it took the form not of lectures, but of displays, um, normally demonstrations of new apparatus. Now, it seems, I don't have the paperwork, unfortunately, but it seems that Bragg, again, wielded his considerable influence to allow Price to present something um, outside the usual remit uh, of the conversaciones, uh, but he still needed something physical, something physically impressive. And I think, again, that fits the bill. I'm not talking about myself, if you understand. <laughs> uh, I just put myself in there for scale. In fact, I'd better move that on. Um, physically uh, impressive objects it is. Now, Price comments uh, that this took several days to build in the workshops of the Cavendish Laboratory. Unfortunately, the names of the technicians, as so often, uh, are not recorded. Um, but the process was actually covered by the BBC Light programme. Um, there was considerable media interest. Uh, and the, the materials, as you can see, were more or less authentic. A wooden disc, a brass epicycle, uh, and, and other parts also in brass. But that is, to an extent, that authenticity is, uh, to some extent, illusory. For example, the brass is not hand-hammered out, as would have been the case for the medieval craftsman. It's rolled, it's cut from a, from a, a sheet that has been rolled by machine. And that continues, for example, with the size. Although it's 72 inches in diameter, as specified by the manuscript, Price must have known by this time that that was something of a thought experiment, that medieval craftsmen wouldn't have been able to build something on this scale, partly because of expense, but partly because of sheer practicality, hammering out that kind of quantity of brass in a manner that would remain, but remain stable. You can see there are lines uh, carved on the disc, and they're the parameters for the planets, uh, the lines of uh, apsides, uh, and, um, and those are 14th century parameters. Uh, so, if Price had wanted to see how it worked and to compare it with current observations, he could easily have updated those to the 20th century, but he chose not to. And so I would suggest that this is not a device designed, uh, or the model is not designed to enable Price to understand the manuscript better. It's not a historical reconstruction in that sense, it's a theatrical prop. That's possibly a bit harsh. But anyway, the, as a theatrical prop, it was extremely successful. The newspapers uh, wrote glowing reviews of this exhibit, particularly within the Conversazione as a whole, and Price, uh, uh, I suppose, um, got what he had wanted. So how did it go from being the talk of the Royal Society to being behind a cabinet at the Whipple Museum? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to talk a little bit about museums uh, and um, one name uh, which uh, has already been mentioned is that of Robert T. Gunther, the first curator of the Oxford Museum of the History of Science, who in 1936 uh, organised an exhibition of historic scientific apparatus here in Cambridge using instruments from the colleges and departments of the university. That was the first time at which the idea of a Cambridge Museum of the History of Science was seriously promoted, 
Uh, but it didn't really become an inevitability, perhaps, until Robert Whipple, the uh, director of the Cambridge Scientific Instrument Company, offered to donate his sizable collection to the university. Uh, and as if the donation itself, as if the offer itself wasn't tempting enough, it was noted that he had another university in mind if Cambridge were to refuse it. So uh, they, they couldn't exactly turn that one down. Still, it wasn't until 1951 that the museum actually opened. And I don't have time to go into all the politics around that, but it, even in 1951, it didn't open on its permanent site. It was in two temporary, quite small rooms. Space was a constraint from the very start. And uh, space continued to be a constraint even after it moved to its permanent home in 1959 because uh, the curators were constantly adding new instruments to the collection. Now, these are some of their priorities. Uh, here's Gunther uh, talking about that exhibition that he organized and the importance of the rarity and the association with great men of science of the instruments on display. Uh, Rupert Hall, the first curator of the Whipple Museum uh, and uh, a man of impeccable establishment credentials, um, talked about, uh, this is an article written on the opening of the exhibition, uh, of the Whipple Museum, I should say. Um, he wrote about their uniqueness, their variety, their beauty, uh, the craftsmen involved in their production, and so forth. Well, King Arthur's table is striking, but it couldn't be called beautiful. The association with Chaucer is problematic anyway, but he couldn't, he's not exactly a great man of science. Um, well, it's debatable. Um, and, uh, and as for a link with craftsmen, well, replicas did exist in the Whipple collection, uh, and I'd love to talk more about that, but uh, time, time is limited. Uh, replicas did exist in the Whipple collection, uh, but they were normally there for particular reasons. For example, replica 17th century <coughs> microscopes, which were made themselves in the late 19th century, so were themselves of some historical interest, but more importantly were part of the Whipple collection. Or a replica of Newton's 1671 reflecting telescope, which had been made for Trinity College in 1953. Uh, and so... Um, the association with a great man of science is, is, is quite strong, clearly. Uh, and in any case, it's only nine inches long, uh, whereas King Arthur's table, uh, as I said, is six foot in diameter. So with all of this, it's not that surprising, I suppose, uh, that it was taken off display remarkably quickly. Uh, I don't have the precise year, unfortunately, but I do know that by 1960, uh, it uh, was um, in store, uh, or indeed off-site altogether. It was moved into storage and taken off-site because the appointment of new lecturers in the department necessitated storage space to be turned into office space. So, back to the <laughs> professionalization of curation again, it's not until 1970 that the Whipple Museum gets its first salaried curator, David Bryden, who comes down uh, from the National Museum of Scotland. And Bryden is in the fortunate position uh, that a lot, of the museum, a lot of the science departments are moving off the main uh, sites in the center of town here, uh, out to the outskirts of town, and he's got a whole lot more storage space. So he sees what kind of objects he can put in that, and he finds as he described to me, uh, a rickety building down by the river, uh, and on the first floor of that rickety building, he finds a whole host of objects which have been literally dumped, as he put it, uh, on the first floor, up a very uh, uncertain flight of stairs. So he naturally wants to bring those back. The only trouble is that he can't get a contractor to take the job on, because the steps are literally about to fall down. Well, that's what the contractors thought anyway. Bryden, not to be deterred, brought the objects back in his own car, but the problem is that the Equatorium was too big to fit in his car. So along with, uh, along with a, a large dividing engine, it stays in storage for some more years. So it eventually makes it back in the 1980s and is accessioned into the Whipple collection in 1985, but by that time, the link uh, with Price or the manuscript uh, has been forgotten. So at some point, and unfortunately I don't have the, uh, the smoking gun, but it received the nickname King Arthur's Table, uh, and that was when you create an electronic catalogue, of course you have to give an object a name, and somebody uh, used the nickname that must have been current around the museum at that time when they digitised the catalogue, uh, I guess about uh, 15 years ago. So, um, so King Arthur's Table stuck. Now, uh, I'll try and summarize all this a little bit. Um, 
we can tell a little bit uh, about museum curators' priorities from, from how they treat these objects and how the King Arthur's table is originally taken in and then discarded and then rediscovered uh, and now put back on display. Uh, some of those priorities in the early years, again, are summarised by Gunther's successor uh, at the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford. Uh, and if you look at the date that he wrote that, you can understand why it is that he was so anxious to collect and preserve above all else. War is a constant threat, and uh, Taylor himself had fought on the Western Front in the First World War, um, so this clearly would have been a concern for him. Compare that, and again, uh, I have to go this, through this quite quickly, so apologi apologies to anybody who thinks I'm oversimplifying the uh, roles of museums, uh, but this is a, a, a comparative uh, text from the Museum of the History of Science, the same museum um, today, uh, clearly focusing on uh, presentation, portrayal to the public. Uh, but um, it's a bit more complicated than that, of course. Here's King Arthur's Table. I'm sorry if you didn't have time to read that. I can go back through the slides later. Uh, here's King Arthur's Table as it is in the Whipple Museum today. Uh, and I have to be careful with my words here because the director uh, is here. Um, but I would say it's fair to say that you could say there are perhaps two aims uh, of the Whipple Museum which are accounted for here. First of all, to show the history of science in all its messy complexity uh, with a bit of nuance, with plenty of those wounded artefacts like uh, we saw in Sam's presentation um, alongside the beautiful works of art associated with great men of science. The other aim uh, is to show a little bit about the research that's done in the university to members of the public who come and visit. And that's why there's a model, a rather ugly looking model, uh, smaller but clearly of the same thing, alongside the larger one. That's one that I made myself in order to try to understand uh, how the object worked. Uh, and it's, um, uh, I'm very flattered that uh, they thought that it was worthy of putting in the museum. But again, that goes and says something a little bit uh, about their aims uh, in, uh, in, in presenting these collections to the public. So King Arthur's Table, I suppose, has a second life now. Uh, it's gone from being uh, a uh, reconstruction of an object uh, made according to a medieval manuscript, really to an evocation of an important and fascinating period in the modern historiography of science. Thank you very much. <laughs>